This week on the audio podcast, episode 67, Sib Synth Notation, we have an interview with SibeliusUsers.org. Will Sibelius survive? We also quickly pass through a whole load of special offers. Adam tries to invent an offer that doesn't exist, and then we get to some hacktastic plunder. All this and more on the audio podcast. This is the 6th of August, uh, 2012. This is uh, episode number 67 of the audio podcast, Sib Simp Notation. Um, I'm Scott Hewitt. This week I'm joined by... Um, Adam Yanch. And today we have on the audio podcast a special guest who we're going to interview. It is Derek Williams of SibeliusUsers.org. Hi, Derek. Hi, uh, Adam, isn't it? Yes. I'm going to make sure I get the images right. So Adam and Scott. Okay, that's great. So um, the reason we've got uh, Derek joining us today is um, obviously, as we covered a couple of weeks back, Avid um, kind of sold off a number of properties to In Music and other things and announced a kind of restructuring. As part of that restructuring, they announced the closure of the Sibelius UK office, which was the, the well, the, the, the kind of headquarters for the Sibelius. And that prompted the SibeliusUsers.org um, site to come about and a campaign from that. So Derek, could you tell us a little bit about the situation? Sibelius is a music scoring program for anyone who's not familiar with it. Uh, what it does is pretty much probably not to the disdain of copyists, because I never met a copyist who really dreamed as a child of being a copyist, but certainly uh, to the great delight of arrangers and composers, allow people to use a machine to create beautiful looking music scores that were always right, and if you make a mistake you can change it on the computer and it's still right, a bit like a word processor, a musical word processor. Now the wonderful thing about Sibelius is that it also produces perfect parts for musicians to play. Now, A-list Hollywood composers, symphonic composers, arrangers, orchestrators, publishers, the world over. Roughly half a million people, it's the world's best-selling score writer, use Sibelius. Universities, the Edinburgh University, where I work and teach and uh, have recently completed my PhD, has Sibelius on every single music machine. So it's not a question in anyone's mind that Sibelius is an amazing tool. Now, it was invented on the Acorn computer, strangely enough, which is now obsolete, by twins, Ben and Jonathan Finn, who are Oxford and Cambridge graduates. And uh, this was something which was done in machine code originally. And it was developed later on for Windows platforms and later after that for Macintosh platform. Now, the amazing thing about pretty much from version one of Sibelius was that it was written for musicians. There's another competing program called Finale, which is written more for publishers. It's a, a very wonderful program too, but Sibelius is the favorite of musicians because it's so intuitive. Now, you can write on the page and you can drag the page around, which is why I migrated to it. You could just move that page around it's like you were hovering over it. Now, I'm actually going to take the liberty of moving my camera around so you can see I have two 30-inch monitors here that I run Sibelius on. And I might actually take the liberty of starting up Sibelius during this interview so you can see just how amazing it is. Now, why did SibeliusUsers.org suddenly appear out of nowhere when Sibelius UK got shut down? Well, at its heart, is the intense loyalty and devotion, not only to the product itself, but to the development team who are very attentive to what users feed back to them. It's almost as though it's, it were, uh, what do they call it, freeware, open source. It, it's almost like open source, except it's not. But people pay money for it. Uh, and heading the team is Daniel Spreadbury, who's the most incredibly busy technical support guy. You'll find him, I've spoken to him at midnight on Saturday, when some people are going to bed or coming back from gigs, and Daniel is there helping Sibelius users. And that's inspired such devotion that uh, we were just outraged when Avid moved into sack them. Okay, now let's look at the sacking. Let's look at what a business model is. And I'm, I'm no enemy of wealth. I think most of us would like to have a few pounds in the bank. I'm certainly not an, element, uh, an enemy of success. And I'm very much in favor of visionaries like Steve Jobs or even Bill Gates. They're visionaries, people who started off in their garage with a pair of pliers and a screwdriver, and whammo, they have this massive 
billion dollar empire, props to them because they did it and they made it work and they, their vision drives the company. Now let's look at the Abbott situation, it's not quite the same. The visionaries were the Finn brothers and they bequeathed that to Abbott in 2006 for $23 million. At that time, Abbott was trading at about, at about $70 a share, $66 to $70 a share. And it was vibrant. It had offices in uh, Japan and Australia, San Francisco, Europe, London, thriving. Now, let's look at what the share price is now. It's $7. That's what the sh an average share is worth now, $7. So it's divided by 10. Now, while we're looking at the share price, let's look at the salary of the CEO, Gary Greenfield. Now, in, in 2009, when he took over, he had to scrape by on $1.2 million a year. I could barely scrape by on that. I'm sure you could too. But in four year, in, between 2009 and 2011, he managed, while the share price was being divided by 10, to multiply his salary by four. So his salary package now, including all the benefits, 4.8 million. Now if, if, if it costs four million dollars to buy failure, what do you have to pay to buy success? Now the people who are at the head of this organization, Avid, you might say, well business is business, you know, if, if, if Sebelius is losing money, well they've got to downsize it, they've got to sack people, they've got to move it offshore, fair enough. But it's not. Sibelius is pretty much the only profitable part of Abbott and it's being used as a cash cow. The money that Sibelius makes, instead of going back into Sibelius, is siphoned off. Sibelius is a cash cow for Abbott who's had stellar Wall Street losses. And assisting those losses is the salaries of the, the board. Now they've shut themselves off from their users while they're busy taking home this money. Now, what our concern now is, the heart and soul of Sibelius is its development team. They sack a lot of them. There's a few staying on now while it gets sent off to the Ukraine. and It's almost certainly going to the Ukraine. They've sent pro tools there. Now, that's, you can't possibly, Sibelius has written in millions of lines of C++ code. And it lives in the minds, and the hearts and minds of its developers, the programmers. If you simply sack everybody and then send the, those millions of lights, you may as well burn them. There'll be as much use. So what we have now is a program which is destined for the same graveyard as Tascam's Giga Studio went. Anyone who had Giga Studio? I have Giga Studio sitting on its CDs, but they can't use it now. It, it, uh, basically, Tascam buried it alive. And that was a company that had something to do with music. And then we have... Uh, Composers Mosaic, a score writer that I used before Sibelius. Its own developers orphaned that, and that's now roadkill. Then let's look at Encore, another score writer, deceased. Another one, Igor, that's gone. All these score writers, now you might say, oh, well, just learn a new score writer. Well, that's all very well. I have hundreds of clients, I have thousands of scores, and I have to keep three computers now, one for Composers Mosaic, which runs Mac OS 9, and then I have to keep another one for the G4 clients, and I have now these Intel clients. Now, Sibelius, if it does not uh, nourished and kept alive, it's going to be exactly the same. They'll, they've got a slim version eight sitting there now, and once that's gone, it won't work on you know whatever comes out to mountain snow snow leopard, well, snow leopard mountain lion. After mountain lion, we'll probably have pussycat or something. You know, whatever the next Mac OS is going to be. Sibelius won't work on that because by then, Avid will be deceased too. Avid is circling the drain and it's probably going to be bought out, my guess is, by some company like Sony or Panasonic. And look at how much those guys have made, 4.8 million a year plus, but now they're running on empty. They don't have to pay any salary, they don't have to have any premises. They can just make all that money, that we reckon it's about 18 million a year that Sibelius brings in. Multiply that by the next four years that Sibelius staggers on, and that's at 100 million that you've got for doing absolutely nothing. And they would say in Wall Street, high fives to you, high fives, because you made 100 million. It's not the sort of visionary people like Steve Jobs, who's a, or uh, who's certainly no longer with us, or Bill Gates, who are, who are uh, philanthropists. 
different kind of people. If you look at the uh, satisfaction of the staff working for Abbott, you go to Glassdoor and look at Abbott, it leaps off the page at you. What do you think the percentage of staff who are satisfied with Abbott? 1.9%. Percentage of satisfaction with this CEO, 5%. So I hope that I've made, given you some yeah. idea where we are. Of course. So um, be, being careful not to em embroil, em embroil our, my organization here too, too deep into this. But um, so uh, as an organization, um, obviously you're looking, you're, where Sibelius users are looking to be involved in trying to safeguard the future of Sibelius, be yes. that be that with Avid or be that not with Avid, and yeah. obviously you, you're expressing the kind of familiar situation to many of our listeners of having made an investment in a software platform yes. only for the hardware to cease to support it and yeah. the software company to have disappeared, which is a circumstance which has happened with many kind of, happens with many things and is yes. an ongoing kind of reoccurrence. So what, what kind of actions are you, what kind of things are you wanting from people like um, if, for our listeners, if they're Sibelius users right now, and I suspect a lot of people probably don't pay a lot of attention you know, to, to this kind of issue. So what, what kind of thing, now that they, you've drawn this to their attention, what kind of thing would you suggest they could perhaps do? Or how, how should they get involved with Sibelius users to help safeguard the future of Sibelius? Well, I think, first of all, the difficulty is getting in touch with this 500,000 approximately, but that's just my rough guess, but I've got reason to believe it's about half a million. Getting in touch with them is difficult because we can't go to Evan and say, would you kindly give us your database so we can complain about you to all your customers? Well, obviously, they're not going to do that. So we have to get in touch with all the users uh, as best we can. Now, one of the advantages of music as an art is that it has society you have Music Arrangers Guilds, um, for example, I belong to the Music Arrangers Guild of Australia, MAGA, they call themselves, and uh, I've been a member of that for many years. Well, recently that went into their latest online newsletter as an, an issue of concern. And they've included links, kindly included links to sibeliususe.org. Uh, you can also, with orchestras, reach a lot of people very quickly. If an orchestra's got 100 people in it, especially uh, community orchestras, most of those people would be using Sibelius at home. Uh, and even Finale users can be our friends too, because we both realize that we need each other as competitors. Some of us, like myself, use both Finale and Sibelius. So I'm not here to badmouth a product. I, I may be badmouthing Avid, but I believe I have good reason for that. But certainly I'm not badmouthing another competing product. But getting in touch with people is the first problem. Then, once you've got in touch with them, how do you convince them there's a problem? Because a lot of people would say, and some have said on the sites, well, isn't it a business's right to do the best they can for their shareholders. Uh, the director's primary obligation is to the shareholders. And the customers only come into it in so far as that benefits the shareholders. If the customers are angry, then the revenue goes down. That affects the shareholders. But it's always focused on the shareholders. So trying to get the message across that it's a real risk to you in the relatively near future is the problem. And I think it's that is part of the problem, but the main thing which we've been successful in getting across this message is the loyalty to the development team and to Daniel Spreadbury, who everybody loves because of his absolute devotion to us, his customers. Uh, and while they've been busy firing all the people on the team, um, he's still been on the, the technical support even now looking after us. So now to, the, the other thing is that people often feel powerless. They think Wall Street is so big and I'm so small. Think again. You're not small. You are not small. No one is small. Did Rosa Parks, who refused to give up her seat on the bus, feel small? Did, did, uh, did any of the great activists of the past, Martin Luther King, did he feel small when he got up there and said he had a dream? One person can make an enormous difference. And every one of those, every person who votes makes a difference. Which party comes in that way? Everyone makes a difference. So don't feel small. Now let's look at people who decide to come and join us to uh, become activists with us. What you can do? Well, you can send an email. We've published the email addresses of the members of the board and you can write a personal email to each and every one of them at a time where you can send one to all of them in one go if you think you've written a masterpiece. You go to sebeliususers.org, take action. There's a place there where you can email the whole board. Now we are very anxious not to be spammers. Uh, 
So we have put a suggested email there, but you're perfectly at liberty to overtype it with your own. You can send a fax. Now, this is where you start to become powerful. Because if you're half a million users, let's say 1%, that's 1 in 100 Sibelius users decide to do something about it. It's 5,000 people. And if every day one of those people sends a 10-page fax, you're emptying 100 fax machines a day. You're getting 5,000 emails a day. Now, I don't know a business that can survive that. I really don't think anyone can just handle 5,000 emails a day. That's just the 1% of the users that we've managed, we've managed to contact 2%. We're still going. What, I'm, what the ambition is, is that they will finally come to see that it's just too much of an embarrassment to keep owning Sibelius. And they'll sell it. We've got buyers waiting with the money. The, the Finn brothers who designed the program went in there twice, tried to buy it back from them. That's how seriously they view what has happened to their beloved creation. Okay, so um, the website is sibeliususers.org, and we have yes. the link up on our on, up on our website from uh, the audio podcast.co.uk. Uh, this is show 67, so you can grab it from the show notes there and the links links directly across to it. So um, at the moment, what you're asking for people is that if they feel that they agree with you and they want to show support for you, then the best thing to do is to email the team, um, email the Avid team, the Avid board about that, and s sign that kind of petition to show a kind of a yes. concern and yes. you know a, a dissatisfaction with the the potential scenario. Because obviously, you know, we, we don't know we, we we don't know what Avid actually intend to do, but so we can only you know, we can only look on, look onto it from the outside in a way that anybody could look at a business from the outside and make kind of some sort of suggestion as to a possible course of action. But yes. I, well, I, I, can tell, I, I can tell you that uh, we have on our team former programmers of Sibelius, quite a few. Um, and you must be aware, of course, that there'll be people, if you look at a 1.9% satisfaction rating, we have sources of information coming to us. I can't be very specific without obviously jeopardizing their, their employment. Now, there are other ways you can also contact and be effective, and that's through Facebook. We have a Facebook site. Save Sibelius on Facebook. You find us there. We've now got uh, 9,000 likes there. That was a matter of a couple of weeks. Now, Avid have websites too. They have their own Avid Technology website, and they've got a Sibelius website, and you can express your opinion there openly on the status updates. And you can go to YouTube, because if you go to YouTube, we put all the videos there about uh, Sibelius on YouTube. You can go there and you can make comments. And believe me, 5,000 people making comments, that can become viral very quickly. You can be effective. You're not powerless. Excellent stuff. Um, Adam, do you have any, any questions there, or are you just there? Uh... Well, Sibelius is, is outside of my realm. I'm more a kind of DAW kind of guy, so I, I don't think I have anything to... Uh, to add to this. Okay, Adam, I just want to give you the opportunity. Well, D Derek, it's been a pleasure speaking with you about this, and thank you very much for bringing it to our attention and our listeners' attention as well. Um, we you wish so. you, we, we obviously wish you all the best in safeguarding the future of Sibelius with yes. w whichever ongoing ownership that happens to be. We would, um, you know, yes. we, you know, we, we, we know we have listeners who are very interested in having investment in Sibelius and I mean, so we're, we're keen for that to, to go along. Um, in, I, I sh should just kind of say to our listeners, but next week we actually have an interview with the development team behind a program called News Score, which pitches itself as the open source alternative to Sibelius as well. So we thought that was a nice little angle to, to pick up from them as well, which is another, another kind of open source option as well, which we thought, I thought would be a cool interview to kind of follow on from this interview. So hence we... Yes, that is... Yes, that is an option. Um, uh, just before I go, that is an option that's also being considered for Sibelius as well. Open source, score, open source, open score. Um, and of course, the thing is to get the thing started. You need to you need to pay development people to get that going. Well, you you also need the code available under that sort of license as well. It's yes. So we'd have to buy it from Avid to make it into open source. Uh, that's being considered. Uh, but ultimately, what we want is on any board from this day onwards, we want one developer at least and one user with full voting rights, irrespective of shareholding. This would not have happened, in my view, if you had people there who actually were inside the engine. If there's a user on there, it's a bit like having student representatives on uh, faculties at universities. It's amazing how effective you can be there. To, I've been up myself. I was a student representative at Edinburgh, and uh, they listen to you. And 
and that they, they allowed me to develop the um, Musical Life in Edinburgh page on the music department site, uh, and you know, they're very open to that sort of thing. So I think if you have a, a board that includes, is open, you know, is transparent, it's, it's always going to be more effective than trying to shut yourself away and go back to your of course, yeah. Chapels meetings. Well, th thank you very much for your time, Derek. Um, I don't know if you're planning on staying around to chat around the other, the rest of the show notes, but I think we're a bit more audio techy from this, a bit more pure audio techy from this point onwards. So perhaps, perhaps it's not to your interest. But um, thank you very much for coming on. And um, if uh, things change or there's any sort of developments, or it, hopefully you're successful in ensuring the future of Sibelius, then we'd love to, you know, we'd love to have you back on the show there to, to get thank a little you bit more much. detail. Thank you for the Thank you, for Scott, for the opportunity. Thank you, Adam. And uh, yeah, well, I, I do hope that people will come to the website and Facebook and YouTube and all the rest of it and, and make their feelings known. I, I hope you're with us. Thank you. I really hope you are. Awesome stuff. Excellent stuff. Well, uh, thank you very much again. Adam, it's time to get into the news. News. Okay. So uh, there's, a, there's a game that... Uh, I'm not sure if I've ever played this game, but uh, you can find it in kind of amusement arcades where a... Uh, a mole comes up from a hole and you've got to whack it with a big hammer. And, uh, yeah, whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole, it's called, um, which is very close to guacamole. Um, they're two completely separate things. Um, but, yes, the, this, uh, this idea of the whack-a-mole game is uh, used as the analogy for um, the problem with piracy online uh, on the Internet in an article in the uh, New York Times. And... You know, yes, maybe uh, having read the article, that is a problem, is that basically, uh, say, you, you have your, uh, your Pirate Bay site that's up there, you know, it gets taken down, but then all of a sudden some new way of pirating uh, music is made available, but kind of multiply as well so uh, yeah the the first the first article is basically talking about this particular kind of concept from the New York Times's perspective it, it's um, an interesting read it, it's an interesting read they, they talk about what the actions that you know kind of the Pirate Bay and people like that have taken I'm saying they, they point out the fact that after massive legal expense, they blocked the Pirate Bay. The U in the UK, the Pirate Bay is now a blocked website. You technically shouldn't ever be able to get there now. However, it's fairly trivial to get there if you want to. And the Pirate Bay, in, a, um, in, in what I would say is, a, is the most obvious exploitation of internet technology possible, not only bought itself a massive, set, massive IPv6 domain set, so it has thousands and thousands of IP addresses to exist at now, but it then also um, completely kind of rebuilt its website in such a way that anybody can clone the entire website and host it at their own domain anyway as well. So Which makes sense, and it's like a kind of... That's part of the internet, isn't it? The well, it's just an address book. I'm saying the Pirate Bay has always just been a big address book, essentially of a big directory of how to go get torrents. And, okay, lots of people... well. I don't want to get into whether the majority or the minority or whatever, but people, you know, use torrents for things they should be sharing like that and things they shouldn't be sharing like that. But essentially, it's a technology that can be used for good or bad, and the technologies are all built and designed to be robust, so you can't easily break them. And this is this kind of whack-a-mole situation that's now coming about. You can't, you know, what I mean, it's, it, you, they need to look somewhere else. I think you can't just keep trying to beat things down because they don't, they don't die. They just reappear elsewhere now. Well, yeah, I mean, the, I suppose the article is almost, it, in, it doesn't really say this, but in between the lines it's saying, you know, you can't continue to work in this way. How, the question is, how do you actually sort out piracy on the internet? And I think the answer, which is not an answer that people in the music business want to hear, or people with intellectual property want to hear, is you have to reform the whole copyright system because the internet faces such a challenge to the copyright system that it cannot they the the two cannot survive together in their current state one has to change and to be honest i can't see it being the internet but i can't see it being copyright either copyright right. law so I suppose that's kind of tr maybe trying to open the discussion of you know what you can do and maybe that's a very um, 
extreme way of 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 taking the the article. An interesting bit at the very end of the article, which I'd never really thought about before, but they point out that now that the 3D printers are starting to become, you know, more and more pre prevalent and more available, they're just saying how they were just pointing out how this kind of intellectual property violation and this kind of stuff is actually going to go from the software and the digital domain and is actually going to is starting to creep into the physical object domain now as well because you can obviously have a physical item scan it get a 3d representation of it and then print your own print yourself another one and they were just saying how you know it it shows you how much of a how much of an urgency there is to find a resolution to these problems because you know e even the physical domain is about to be kind of crushed or at least you know succumb to well, these issues influenced well. impacted by the same problems problems in inverted commas well they are problems but you know who who are the problems for uh, that the virtual world the software world has so yeah anyway that's a it's an interesting read and i think yeah linking in with the 3d printer aspect also kind of shows where this kind of thing is going and the urgency of seeking a resolution now i have to put my hand up here um i I am a, not only am I a guest presenter on the audio podcast, I'm also a listener and I do listen back to every show and I listen back to uh, one of the older, the, the show that we were talking about Nuendo live in, and I listened back to that on the train recently and I just thought, what am I talking about, you know, I just, I knew straight away that I didn't really know what Nuendo live was and I was sort of talking rubbish on the show so I put my hand up and say I apologize for that um, and it links nicely in with this story which is that uh, there's a cross grade offer from Steinberg to get the full version of Nuendo um, if you're a Nuendo live user and you get 15 15% 15 off? Hey, yeah that's, that's right 15% that's right. so you have to already have Nuendo live and then you get 15% off the full version of Nuendo yeah and I now, guess the idea there is that you start, you make all your recordings live on Nuendo Live and then you can just take them home and whack them straight into Nuendo to produce them. Yeah, and if you get the correct version of Nuendo, 5.5.4, uh, um, it will actually open the native format of Nuendo Live as well. So you can literally record, save, and then open. Uh, open in Nuendo. That's a good, a good workflow, I think. That's a, a very smart thing to do. And they, they point out, I'm saying, I, I thought it was well written, so I copied it across. It's in our show notes, but um, it has a reasons to cross grade, and cross grade. And the main thing there, it points out, is the post production facilities within Nuendo to work on the life, the Nuendo live session files. So it is, it is well written, apart from one thing, and that's the word wealth, wealth. does not have a first H in it. It's not W H. E A, and that's actually on the website. That's not a spelling mistake on the audio podcast. It's spelled but, like that on the website. But what am but I going to do about that now? Otherwise, it's great. Otherwise, it's great. What am I going to do about that? I don't know what I'm going to do now. <laughs> do, no, I, well, do, I, do I fix the, the spelling mistake off the I, I think what you do is you put, after the word wealth, you put sick in brackets, S-I-C, to say that that's how it's spelled in the original. That's, that's how you do it in, ac in academia, I think. That's that's, That's very what nice. I was doing anyway. The the fifteen percent off normal price had a little star and basically something which said that it's fifteen percent off in a price, you know, a, a off a kind of suggested retail price in a certain currency, which should be about the same for everything else. But yeah, you know. So as usual, read the terms and conditions, yes. and that should give you the full information about that offer. Another offer that Ooh. is out there right now is uh, from Isotope, the Stutter Edit Offer. Um, you're going to tell us about this, Scott, because I can't remember the details. Well, uh, Isotope is offering Stutter Edit at a discount price until August the 10th, 2012. Oh, nice. And uh, whilst we're on the subject of software, we might as well just mention, because it's in the notes, that Autotune Live has been released. Yeah. Um, I don't really want to talk about Autotune Live because I'm not interested in Autotune, you know? I, I well, like Imperfection. Imperfection is, is such an important thing. Why would you want to get rid of it? And, and I, I, I'm not being distracted by that remark there. So yes, uh, Antarius have uh, released Autotune Live, um, which is, you know, Autotune as we've come to know, love and loathe, 
but you can now run it in a near real, well, in a real time situation. It has a slight latency as you'd expect, but essentially it's there. Ultra low latency, uh, MIDI control across the parameters. Um, some of the text blurb was actually really cool because it has things like throat modeling in there now, which I throat thought was modeling. nice. Yeah, so you, does that mean that you can actually change the formants in your voice to make it sound like you're someone else? I, I haven't played with it to see if it goes to that extreme, but I, I, belie I believe you can make modifications to the kind of timbral quality of the, of the kind of vocal sounds that you're, mm. that you're working with, or, or any sound, because obviously you could put anything through it that's designed to do voice, vocal. But you could I mean, I suppose I'd be it. interested in, in just its creative possibilities, but I, I'm just not really a fan of autotune. I think there are lots of people who aren't, but as well, but I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. So let's right. move on. Um, well, ju just just to point out to you, there is a demo. There is a there is a free demo. It runs uh, Windows and Mac, RTASA, VST, and Audio AU as well. So and a demo. I never realized there was a free de there was a demo version available. So that's pretty cool. Let's move on, Adam. Then the full spread. The full spread. So uh, in a continuation of their summer. Uh, it is IK okay, Multimedia here. I've got the summer thing. Or am I thinking of someone else? No, it's somebody else. There, there's ah. no summer. There's no summer offers. Summer offers this week. That's that'd be next week. It's every fortnight, I think. Every fortnight. Okay. So forget that that link. That's uh, that's wrong. I've got the wrong company. But uh, IK Multimedia have announced the release of Arc Two, which is a method of uh, trying to remove the sound of your room from your monitoring effectively so you can achieve the best mix possible, the most neutral mix possible. Um, and you and I, Scott, we kind of know how this works because we've got, we've got some buddies who, who've kind of done a similar kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a nice idea. The IK Multimedia version comes with the software necessary to do it, but it also comes with a very specific microphone um, that w that's correlated to work with the software so that you don't get the sound of the microphone altering the response that you get back from it. Um, but yeah, uh, it comes with all of the necessary bits and pieces you need to set up a, uh, a correction of your room and monitoring system, Yeah, basically. So you can use this system to, to correct any sort of acoustic deficiencies in your monitoring environment. So it, it's designed primarily for kind of studio, you know, for kind of studio and production rooms, production room use. Um, and in this version, what they've actually also added in is a, a virtual monitoring system as well, where you can actually simulate other environments. Now, obviously, you can only simulate to a lesser environment than the one you're in, but so things like, you know, a boombox or a car stereo and those kind of things can also be done now as well. So if you want to kind of get a feel for what it sounds like on a typical insert per listening environment, then you can also use the ARC system, the ARC-T system to do that as well. So that's kind of... Of course, you don't have to do that. You can buy the ARC-T system and you can, if you just feel like you need to get out of the studio, go for a drive in the car, take the mix with you, you can still do that. No problem. Yeah. I, I like that too, you know, just just compress your audio completely flat, make it, normalize it all the way up and then blast it down, in, down your ears as you try and walk down the road. It works for me as well. Yeah, all right. Excellent. As this podcast comes to your ears right now, like this. <laughs> so I believe that's the end of the news, Scott. We charged through the news, didn't we? Well, well, yeah, I mean, lots of it was, there wasn't much detail to be had. I mean, you know, it's just some offers and... Uh, but that's fine, that's fine. It's the summer, isn't it? It's the summer, it's the summer. You know what we should do? We should go plunder. Arr. Plunder. I'm not really getting, I'm not really doing an R, I'm doing a kind of a rrrr these it's days. It's like a roar there. It's, it's your roar, roar, that's what it is. Yeah, it's, it's a holdover from last week uh, where I used this fabulous delay effect. Hold on, hold on. Oh, Did okay, the... here it comes. Roar. Th I said that properly that, that time, so it was proper stereo. Oh, we do bounce in stereo, don't we? No. <laughs> no? Oh. So you're going to get the mono interpretation of that. Sorry, guys. No, that, actually, that's not true. No, there is a, there is a stereo bounce made, but it's, you're, you're, you'll be mono on that stereo bounce, Adam. I'm sorry. That's a limitation of the Hangout, I suppose. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, into the plunder. And uh, hack-based people, people who like hacking instruments, are going to enjoy this plunder. There's some, there's some good plunder here. And Scott, what's our first well, item? First one, Lifehacker linked to a video which walks through um, a hardware hack of the Zoom H2 recorder, which lets you uh, put four line level inputs into it at the same time. So yeah. It's, it, it's, it's detailed. The, the hack, is, the hack is, is messy, quite convoluted, but it is very detailed. So I you, think it's you are a, it's a medium, adding in the resistors. I think it's a medium level. It's not easy. It's not really hard. You have to be kind of experienced. But anyone who's done some hacking before should be able to uh, take it on. Of course, if you have uh, an H2 and you attempt the hack, having listened to the audio podcast and said, oh, yeah, the whole audio podcast have put it on their show, so that must be a good idea, and you break your H2, it's not our fault. It's your fault. You but, if, decision. but if it does work out, then that would be cool to let us know that it worked out. Yes, that would be good too. So we can take some credit there too. So, you so know, we'll, we'll audio be clear podcast about that. wins. Yeah, we'll be clear about that. If it goes well, we'd like to know. And if it doesn't go well, we didn't tell you to do it. That's just... but, but it looks fantastic. So on, on the back of the unit, you have some holes drilled and it's phono uh, inputs. Two, yeah. two pairs of phono inputs either side of the battery compartment and then two toggle switches above. So you can switch from the original to the new inputs. So you can either have the mics coming in or the uh, the new phono inputs. It's a, it's a lovely little hack. And um, phono, the phono connector is it, that's it's almost a historical item. It's it's an example of the history surrounding audio technology like MIDI and the history of things that just doesn't die. But and it's great that audio technology has so much living history in it, as Adam. Scott, I, I didn't know that you were so nostalgic over the uh, over over the the phono socket of all things. And the MIDI protocol. Don't forget the MIDI protocol. <laughs> well, we we do have our fans of the MIDI protocol here at the Audio Podcast. I'm one. Sam Freeman is another. Uh, Scott, I, uh, w you like MIDI? Yeah, it's okay. I think you think it's all right, though. You know. I have a feeling you wouldn't mind seeing it replaced. I don't think it's going to be replaced anytime soon. I like MIDI. Now, if you have a love of history, like us here on the audio podcast, you might well be interested to read the story of the SM57. And now, you can. I'm very interested in the SM57 because everyone talks about the SM58, which is the mic that you have right there. Um, I don't have that. I've got an AKG of some description. But the SM57 has always been a kind of interesting mic to me because it's like very similar but different and they're used for completely different things most of the time. Like They're pretty interchangeable as I understand it, but people tend to use the 57 for guitars more than vocals, if I'm correct. Well, yeah, anyway. the, the, there are dif yeah there, there are differences between a 57 and a 58, and there are... They're, they do get very different sounds. If you have the two of them together beside each other, what you get from them is very different. It's, it's, it, well, not very different, but there are differences between them. But let, let's not get distracted by that. Let's just invite people to enjoy the beautiful history lesson available courtesy of Sure, obviously. And you can get the link from our show notes at theaudiopodcast.co.uk. Now, I, I do prefer the look of the SM57, I have to say. Now, uh, our final uh, hack-based post today is that of uh, audio presto synth modifications now this isn't actually some this is about hacking but it's not something that you should do because it's basically uh, circuit bending on the scale of a profit 5 synthesizer so it's not something that you're going to want to take undertake yourself unless you really know what you're doing but basically audio presto have a synth workshop and on their website and on the synth workshop page, there's a list of old school synthesizers, things like the uh, Juno 108, the Korg Monopoly, the Prophet 5. Is there a, a TR-808 there as well? I think there was, yeah. Um, that have been hacked in some way by the workshop. So um, I'm just trying to think of something that's... Uh, some of the hacks that have happened... Well, they, they actually did. I put a picture because I, I thought there were some cool pictures here. So I've actually put a picture up here of the of the Juno of a Juno hack where they've taken the two 
two synth units and actually combined them together into oh. the onto the one keyboard, so you essentially get twice as many modulators running at the same time. That's Wait. amazing. That's, and it looks really cool. Like, I mean, super cool. you look at that and you're like, that is like a proper Frankenstein of a keyboard. Some of the other ones, like the Monopoly was just like this old school like toggle switch just bolted onto the top of the chassis and, and a big button. But that looks proper nice. That looks tight. Proper nice. Proper nice. So if you're interested in um, high scale hardware hacking, Definitely head to the uh, audio podcast at co.uk. This is show 67. Um, right at the bottom of the page, audio presto synth modifications, and take a look at uh, what they've done there. So that's the end of the plunder. That, that's the end of the plunder. So, um, yeah, so, so it is. So just before we finish the show off, a little bit of sad news for our regular listeners, but next week's show will be the final of the summer season. Um, no! Then we're then going to take uh, two weeks off, uh, w one week off, then the bank holiday week, and we should be back the first Monday in September. I haven't actually looked to see what that date is, though, so perhaps it won't work. Perhaps we won't. I'd, we'll be back the first Monday of September, or at least something will appear the first mon Monday of September. Yay! And that'll be us. Yay! And we should have like a back to school special. I've been thinking about that. I'm going to execute on that idea because I just said it out loud, which means I want back to school. Back that. to school special. Well, I mean, what does what does that mean? I don't know. I just thought it'd be a cool way to start the next season. Are we talking cool. like Grange Hill back to school special? Yeah. Why not? Why right. Not? Okay. So that's awesome. Let's not say much more about this though, because I don't. To be honest, I don't remember what season we're currently in, and I haven't got any of my notes that tell me that information. Cause Four. I didn't I know you were numbering them. To be honest. We we are, we number them based on extended ho on holidays. So we we are. I think this could be season four. Actually, it's probably around about there. But anyway, that's what it's been. So this has been uh, the audio podcast, uh, episode 67, Sib Synth Notation. And we had Derek Williams earlier on um, in an interview, which was great. Um, I've been Scott Hewitt for the duration of this uh, show. And I have been and will continue to be Adam Yanch for uh, the, the reigning parts of the show. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.